Hello and welcome to the Customer Architecture and Engineering YouTube channel. Uh, today we're going to be recording and presenting our first video in hopefully a long series of videos about the Azure Landing Zones conceptual architecture and some of uh, the key design areas and principles that we want to get across to you, as well as many other things that we've got planned for this channel, so please stay tuned. So today we want to get into a bit about around the Azure Landing Zones uh, design principle of subscription democratization and really the, the key question of how many subscriptions should I use in Azure, right? It's a key question we all get from our customers and something that we figured be great to record a short video on and help you make these key decisions to work out when to do, you know, a separate subscription or maybe keep everything in one subscription. And we'll discuss all of those points today. For those of you that may be a little bit newer to Azure landing zones and have not had a chance to see it yet, um, I would highly recommend uh, going to check out our documentation, which is on the link below. Um, but this is our conceptual architecture diagram that we're showing here. And for the context of today's conversation, we're very much going to be focusing on the bits inside of this sort of pink highlighted area, uh, which is our landing zone subscriptions that are supported by the Azure landing zones uh, platform that we've put in place. So for those of you that are new to ALZ, please go and check out the documentation. Um, but this is just to help level set the conversation for today. So when we're you know, getting into the benefits of Azure Landing Zones, Matt, what are some of the key considerations and points that we want to get across to our customer? Thanks, Jack. I think the first one is that subscriptions, more subscriptions aren't actually any harder to manage than one single subscription. Um, all of our tooling, including the portal, can display multiple subscriptions at once. So, and they don't cost any more. So actually there's no reason not to do it from a kind of cost or admin overhead point of view. I think the second and most important one really is that moving resources between subscriptions in Azure is, is quite difficult. We do have some tooling available like Azure Resource Mover, but when you, as soon as you move a resource in Azure, it's resource ID changes and that anything that's kind of pointing to that resource ID, uh, it, it may experience problems once you've moved it. Um, also, we tend to want to do subscription RBAC and uh, policy at quite a high level in, in the kind of, uh, in the hierarchy. So, RBAC tends to be at the subscription level and policy tends to be at the management group level. So actually using separate subscriptions kind of simplifies that model. And finally, enabling multiple subscriptions enables your application and development teams to iterate whilst the platform team maintains control. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's some key points there to take away and hopefully a lot of those have resonated with you who've seen the architecture before. And I think if we're to take that one step further, Kevin, to bring you into the conversation, this is sort of some decision criteria right, that me, uh, Matt and yourself put together recently to try and help make this, you know, how do customers take this to action, right? Do you want to just take us through a couple of these points? Yeah, of course, Jack. Um, so a lot of this is really based around our design areas. So if you look at the documentation we've got on the Cloud Adoption Framework website, you know, we talk about design areas for the Azure landing zones. And what we've tried to do is really summarize the areas that we feel are important when you talk about it in the context of subscription democratization. Um, so the decision areas you're looking to really focus on is, you know, how does your business operate within its IT department? So, you know, do you have multiple teams or individual teams looking after your platform resources? You know, who's looking after each of the application workloads? You know, those are a really key area of how you look at splitting up your subscriptions to make sure that you've got that RBAC model that Matt just mentioned, really sort of put into place and don't get into a complex state where within a subscription, you're trying to do that using resource groups. You know, this allows you to focus on resource groups being used more for lifecycle management and change management rather than permissions and billing. Um, the next part on this is networking. So, you know, a lot of applications are often bound by subnet, for example. So if you've got a set of applications that need to all sit in the same subnet, then it's much easier, particularly if they've got overlapping IP assignments within an address space, you know, to ensure that those are all in the same subnet. Now, because of the limitations of Azure, they would have to be within the same subscription. So you know, that would be another consideration. Um, and when we start moving on to the sort of the broader topic, so things like governance, you know, you're often looking at the differences between maybe an online or a corp workload. So something that's going to be facing out to the internet versus something that's kept internal and private and maybe has hybrid connectivity back to your on-premise. You know, so those different governance models are going to sort of be a lot harder to implement at a granular level within a subscription. So choosing multiple subscriptions lets you put them across different governance models. Um, and by same virtue, you know, environments is often a question we often get asked about. 
We try to encourage customers not to do different governance across different environments, but actually there's often a requirement from, again, an RBAC perspective to put different environments into different subscriptions because you're going to have different people accessing them and different levels of control over who can make what changes. Um, and finally, the fifth point we've got on here is subscription limits. And this is really one of the primary drivers behind why we recommend scaling with subscriptions rather than scaling with resource groups. Um, a lot of the platform limitations are focused more on a subscription level limit rather than a resource group level limit. Um, so by using multiple subscriptions, you overcome a lot of the constraints that customers often face once they've moved up to a much larger scale and are doing large scale deployments with sort of, for example, you know, many virtual machines in a single subscription. No, I think there's some great points in there. And uh, obviously, we're going to try and make these a little bit more real in the next slide. I think a key point to get across here is all of these things are documented in our, our cloud adoption framework docs, as you mentioned, Kevin. And again, go and check out the link uh, that we're posting on screen now. And you'll be able to find all of these uh, guidance points in our design areas. So as I said, if we were to make this a little bit more real, you know, what are some of these are some of the common scenarios we see, right? You know, obviously the first one is something that we've designed and suggested as a starting point where we would separate out those platform components in terms of connectivity, identity and management. So we, we suggest three subscriptions for these. They all live beneath uh, separate management groups beneath platform because they have a different different governance profile in terms of who needs to access them and what controls we need to apply upon those subscriptions. But also from a scale perspective in the future, you know, by having a connectivity management group, if we've got a very large networking requirement, it's very easy to add more connectivity subscriptions in that same management group hierarchy and keep going, knowing the controls are going to remain consistent upon them. Right. So I think that's the first point to get across. Um, Kevin, you, you get quite involved in a lot of uh, sort of lift and shift conversations and, and those sort of areas. What are the considerations and how does subscription democratization work in those sort of areas? That's a great question, because we see a lot of situations where customers will design a scenario or that maybe they'll work with one of the partners, um, you know, even with Microsoft themselves, you know, and they'll start with one subscription because that's the obvious place to go for a data center migration. And actually, you know, we see nothing wrong with the idea of data center in a cloud, you know, being mapped to a single subscription. Uh, but one of the things we really like to encourage customers to do is to look at the other kind of stages they're going to go through in their cloud adoption journey. So, you know, we've got examples on here of the new workloads and MVP development, but, you know, just even thinking about specifically a data center migration, you know, if you build everything into a single subscription and you're then looking to grow in the future, how do you grow? You know, if you've put your networking all in that central subscription, are you going to peer the networks in all your new subscriptions back to your data center in a cloud? Or is your longer term business objective to actually modernize all your applications and get to a state where everything has been made more cloud native? So you get all the kind of the primary benefits of a cloud operating model. Um, you know, at which point, what are you going to be ending up with at the end? Will you have just networking in that data center subscription? You know, basically what we're trying to say is, you know, start off with a scalable architecture move out the critical parts, which are likely to be common across both your data center in the cloud and your modern workloads, and make sure that you've really got those things aligned in such a way that you can grow your business successfully. Um, and yeah, I think that kind of junctures quite nicely into the whole thing of you know, new workloads and MVP development. Um, so Matt, can you talk us a little bit about how a customer might take some of their applications and move from a data center in a cloud model to running new workloads? Yeah, absolutely. I think what's important here is when we talk about new net new workloads in the cloud or cloud native applications is that subscriptions are given to teams of developers, right? So you give a subscription to a team and it's up to that team kind of how they put which applications they put in that subscription. They might find it better to put two or three tightly coupled applications into a single subscription if that works for them. Or alternatively, they might have to um, services which are, are somewhat different and they might find that different subscriptions work better, maybe from an RBAC perspective. So it kind of depends, but ultimately you'll remember you're giving the subscription to a team of people. Um, for MVP, um, so for net new workloads, sometimes we might advocate the use of a sandbox subscription um, for a development spike or to try out new products and services which may be not supported or through policy in the uh, main management group hierarchy. So, Use of sandbox subscriptions 
create them a net new environment, see if it works, and then migrate it back into your production environment when it's ready. Alternatively, the other option is sometimes you don't need a new subscription to do development. You might find that you can do it in an existing subscription. It, it kind of depends, and there's no hard and fast rule there. You've got to just kind of, kind of find what works for you. Yeah, and I think you make a great point there, Matt. And you know, a lot of your points relate back to that governance decision criteria point that we made, right? If you've got different governance requirements, you know, if a workload, uh, say a team has a you know three applications that they're looking after, and one of them needs to be PCI compliant, it doesn't make sense to put them all in the same subscription, right? It makes sense to split that other subscription, or so, sorry, split that application into another subscription, which you can apply those PCI controls to whilst the others don't have to be PCI compliant and therefore can operate slightly differently. Right? So I think really relating back to those, those key uh, decision criteria we showed earlier are key to keep in mind uh, for this conversation. So I think if we're to sort of try and bring this to a close and try and round this off in a, in a very short video, and obviously if people want to see more, please let us know in the comments below and we'll be happy to dive in deeper into some of these topics uh, at a later date. Um, but some key takeaways, I think from what you were saying, Kevin, around the lift and shift, right? Don't put everything in a single subscription because that doesn't enable future growth, right? It'll set you up for scale. So keeping platform subscriptions separate from the start is a very good uh, starting point on that journey of making your architecture scalable and flexible, right? You haven't got to go through that painful conversation of moving a, an express route circuit or moving something that is going to require downtime into another subscription. You've set yourself up for success right from the start just by doing something very simple early on. Um, I think you may point to very clearly in your, in your point, you know, it's okay to lift and shift into a single subscription uh, for speed and simplicity. But if you have that time, it may be better for you to think about democratizing as you go on that journey. Um, and especially as you transform into sort of those more modern or net new workload conversations that Matt was talking around. And I think we all agree with this one. And this is something that sometimes people get caught out by is availability zones across subscriptions are not the same. Right. And I think it's important for us to call out that. Uh, zone one, two, and three in subscription one won't be potentially the same as uh, zone one, two, and three in subscription two. Behind the scenes, they could map to different physical zones. There are ways that you can find this information. That there's an API that you can find this information out, and you know you can go through support to find this information out. Um, but it's worth keeping in mind. So if you're designing a very latency sensitive application you might need to ensure that you're doing some sort of subscription uh, subscription zone mapping if, by your own subscriptions if you need to have that you know, really super low latency. Um, and again, that might be a decision criteria based on networking to say, don't put them in separate subscriptions, right? You know, that it's those conversations that uh, you need to be thinking around. Any other key points, team, to, uh, to, to share before we uh, try and wrap this up? I think a common question we get asked actually is, why do we not just apply man um apply policy to subscriptions? You know, why do we do it to management groups? Yeah. So the answer I always give to that, Kevin, is that in an ideal world, we would want to grant the, land, the, the development team a kind of subscription owner role. Now, that's not always possible, but we should aim for uh, and perhaps assume that they might have to have subscription owner at some point. And as soon as they have subscription owner, then they can edit the policies on that subscription. So that's why I kind of like that separation between the management group and, and the sub from a from a governance perspective. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's really important to reinforce, right, that just because they have the permissions to uh, edit the subscriptions that are applied on that, sorry, edit the policies that are applied to that subscription, they can't edit or play with the ones that they're inherited that are inherited to that subscription, right? So you don't break the governance model. It's not like they can suddenly exclude themselves from all the policies that you've applied from above because of that inheritance model that exists within the usual management scopes. Yeah, and I think that's a really useful point to keep in mind as well when thinking about the platform subscriptions. Because um, a common question we get is, why do you have a one-to-one -one relationship between a management group and a subscription for a single function? Yeah, and it's all to do with that ability to enforce inheritance of those policies down onto those subscriptions. And again, enables the autonomy as part of subscription democratization for the team responsible for the workload within that subscription. Yeah, absolutely. Like treat platform subscriptions just as any other landing zone subscription, right? They just serve yeah. a platform function. Yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you both, gents, for your time today. Some great points there that hopefully everybody's uh, get, got some real value from. Um, as I say, this is the first in many of many videos, hopefully, to come out of our CAE series. So uh, if you have got any ideas for things you want us to dive deeper into, um, please check out the link in the YouTube channel and leave us a comment on our videos. And we can certainly look into adding some more content for you all to uh, get some of our knowledge sharing out there.
but yeah um thank you everybody and uh, catch you next time